Good. So welcome everybody. Now we have a talk uh, from Dan Stovell and Jerry Clough is involved as well. But Dan will talk to us about solar panels, mapping solar panels and how they can save megatons of COW. Let's see why. Thank you. Okay, so can you hear me okay? Seems like it's okay. Good, bad? Good. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I am here talking about solar panels and uh, I've been involved in OpenStreetMap for uh, almost 10 years now. <clears throat> um, in fact, the last time I was at an OpenStreetMap was, uh, sorry, a state of the map event was uh, in 2013 at the height of my addiction. Uh, I'm recovering now. But the reason I'm back uh, is specifically because of this thing which was really new to me this year, essentially. Uh, we would all like to do something about climate change, and we, there are various things that OpenStreetMap is good for, but it's quite novel to me that uh, we can do something, uh, something, something concrete about climate change by editing OpenStreetMap. So, let me explain. This was something that, came, that was um, proposed actually by uh, a, a collaborator of mine who's uh, Jack Kelly, who, who started uh, a foundation called Open Climate Fix. And they, one of the tasks that they want to work on is predicting the output from solar panels. What may be surprising to a lot of people is that even in uh, very advanced uh, technological countries, uh, we don't know how much energy is coming in to the national electricity grid from solar panels. There are specific re reasons behind that that we actually don't know. So if we can predict how much energy is coming from solar panels, then we can burn less fossil fuels. At a, at a national level, certainly in the UK and in, in most other European countries as well, for example. So what we want to do uh, is put two things in here. To predict what is coming from solar panels, we need to predict, firstly, the sh very short term, uh, essentially weather predictions, but they're, they're actually quite detailed cloud cover predictions that tell us about the solar irradiation. Um, and if we put those together with the exact locations and other information about solar panels, then the problem is solved. We can predict the amount of electricity coming from solar panels and we can actually save, on the global scale, megatons of, co of CO2 equivalent. So this is, this is concrete. If you want to see the uh, calculations behind that, they are available. I'm not going to talk more about the calculations, but this is, this is one of the main points that I want to make. That Actually, mapping solar panels does have, can have, a direct impact. Um, in OpenStreetMap already, there, are, there is plenty of great information about uh, electricity and power networks. Uh, this, oops, sorry, wrong button. This, um, this visualization uh, is something created by, uh, not by me, but it's been going for a while, Open InfraMap, and it's, it shows uh, a really gorgeous rendering of various different aspects of the power network uh, that, that is captured in OpenStreetMap. There are some countries that already have really good mapping of solar panels and solar farms. Uh, we're talking, I'm talking here from a UK context where we're going to use, uh, we want to pilot what we want to do in the UK before taking it out to a global scale. So, in OpenStreetMap, certainly at the start of the year, there was very little data about uh, solar panels and solar farms in the UK. Uh, but there, is, there are other sources of data. There are official data. This, uh, what you see on the right, is a rendering of some of the, the open data that comes from the UK government. So, it's great that the UK government provides this data in nicely licensed open data formats, and we can use that. It doesn't give us the whole answer because, for example, the locations of uh, solar installations in those data are often approximate or, or maybe uh, address-based rather than latitude-longitude-based, which has some complications. Um, and generally, there is good coverage of large-scale uh, installations, but actually, 
the, the missing part of the puzzle is often the small scale domestic and commercial solar panels. And that's important. I'm going to be talking about the UK, but a lot of these lessons carry over to other countries as well, certainly in the global north. Um, in the UK, we have uh, about a thousand solar farms and about a million solar panels. Okay, and our goal is to map them all. We're not just interested in the solar farms, important as they are, we're also definitely in, in, in interested in the smaller scale solar panels because they actually contribute together a significant amount of the solar capacity that's available in the country. <clears throat> the other thing to, to note is that in aerial imagery, uh, it's actually pretty easy to spot solar farms, usually the larger installations, whereas these things, as we'll see, can be trickier. So we want both of these things. They're quite different. A solar farm, quite a large object, often with metadata available, and, and smaller domestic solar panels are, are quite a different uh, thing to map. So um, one of the things that other people always uh, ask when they hear about this project is why not use machine vision? Why not apply some machine learning to this? And it is possible there are projects specifically dedicated to detecting uh, these kind of installations. Um, they can detect large farms very well. They're strange objects when you look in uh, aerial imagery. I don't know if you've seen them yourself, but as, uh, as you might be able to see on here, they're very often oriented due south. Uh, and they're, 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 so they look different to, uh, to most other things you might encounter. Uh, small scale is very difficult. Um, this, this is an example that I've found myself. This is in London, and there are, in this image, uh, three different types of solar panel uh, actually next door to each other in the same street. And they're all very different. The actual uh, visual qualities of them, they're different shapes, they're different layouts. Some of them are flat, some of them are standing up. Um, and one thing we've found as we've gone through this is that uh, for aerial imagery, it's not just the quality that is crucial for this. We would love to uh, have you know, as, as, as fine resolution imagery as we can. Um, it's also important to have the age. Uh, so knowing the age of the imagery would be great, but actually a lot of the solar capacity uh, in, the, in, in many countries has actually been installed very recently, in uh, certainly the past five years and maybe the past two or one year. Um, so fresh imagery is gonna be uh, vital for this if you want to do it purely through uh, aerial imagery. Uh, also for machine vision, you need training data. Um, and so um, I'll put the machine vision aside for the moment, but th that also comes into play here. There are a lot of false friends that you find when you encounter this. It's really, um, <laughs> there are a lot of things that are very, very difficult to disambiguate in aerial imagery. If you go to visit a place, you might be able to tell the difference between uh, a window in a roof and a solar panel on a roof. And uh, especially with good imagery, it can be uh, resolvable, but it's very, very difficult sometimes. Um, this is a lovely example that I, I found, which has, uh, you see there is a, a sort of commercial scale set of solar panels uh, on the right there, but uh, if, you, if you think about the visual image there and compare that to these windows in the side of a block of flats, you know, you can see there are a lot of false friends, there are a lot of things that have relatively similar appearance. Certainly going to be confusing for machine learning algorithms, and it really does make a bit of a headache when you're doing aerial, manual aerial uh, scanning as well. Um, also, uh, I live near a canal, and so uh, I, I know for sure that I see a lot of canal, uh, solar panels on, when I walk up the canal, but I don't want to map them because they're not going to be very useful long term. So what we did as a UK community was a quarterly project. So this is something that regularly happens, organized by the UK-based uh, uh, OSM community. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, the community uh, uh, was interested in the idea of mapping solar panels. Uh, so we have, uh, oops, uh, that's the wrong button, here we go. We, we organize it through the, the wiki, and there's also this very nice uh, tool which uh, Gregory Williams uh, created, 
which uses the official data that I mentioned earlier. It uses the official data to help us search for locations uh, that are going to be good places to go through and map from aerial imagery. Um, the, the, the process ran, uh, the, uh, it's a three month project and it's just about coming to its conclusion. So it's July, August, September this year. Um, a couple of things about tagging. So the basics are easy. We have uh, the standard power uh, tagging scheme is great. We have, we have tagging for solar farms, we have tagging for solar panels, fantastic. Um, there are a couple, of, uh, a couple of extra metadata which are uh, particularly useful. So, we would love to know the capacity, the power output that we're going to expect from any given installation. For solar farms, that's, that's often public because of the planning data. So if something is a 100 megawatt farm or a 50 or a 10 megawatt, often we know that. And clearly, if we want to predict the amount of electricity coming from a, uh, from a power plant, then that's, this is one of the most important things. But for domestic installations, we very rarely know this. We very rarely have access to this. Uh, so we use proxies. So as you see, we've got, for example, counting the number of modules, the number of squares that you see on a, on a rooftop, or the area that you get from the polygon. Both of these are, are things that we use as heuristics which are going to help us to estimate the power output. Um, the other thing that's really uh, useful in terms of the small scale is the orientation. So is it pointing due south? Is it pointing west, east? Uh, when we come to the prediction part of this, uh, the orientation with respect to the sun is going to be really useful in, in, in predicting over a scale of minutes and hours the profile of energy that's coming out of this. So one thing I will advocate is uh, to try to capture the orientation of these things, uh, which we can do from aerial mapping. It gets a little bit more confusing when you're doing in-person mapping in the street because, you know, thinking about where compass directions are is, 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 is a little bit of an extra um, thought process. Um, also, the start date. So the installation date, if you know it, is useful. Um, it's useful for two spe special reasons. One is that when we come to try and detect these things in aerial imagery, uh, we will know if it's supposed to be in a particular set of aerial imagery or not. Uh, and secondly, the, start, the installation date, all, again, helps us to predict the power output because that helps us to, to, to know what type of technology might be installed. And so, and so it gives us a little, another clue about the possible power output. Um, the other thing that I've mentioned up here is about nodes versus areas. Uh, a lot of the mapping that we've had is, has been uh, dropping nodes into place, uh, which can be very fast. Um, but uh, counter arguments against that are if we draw areas, so uh, putting a nice uh, uh, polygon around uh, this, a solar installation, then that helps us to estimate orientation. Um, it helps us in validation. It helps us to be sure that this, uh, this module on one house is actually the one that was intended and not the one on the next house, for example. So it, it can be helpful. Nodes versus areas for this task is not a resolved question, I'm going to say. Um, we are going to use both of these things for our project, and we are going to use them in future machine learning uh, work, but we will see which, which is the best approach. So, I talked about the OSM quarterly project. Um, the progress was pretty good. So, what you see on the screen at the moment is the progress before we started the, solar, the, the quarterly project. So, um, in about March, we started talking about it, and so a few of us started mapping things just to try things out. Um, and so, we, have, we started the year with, I think, 5,000 uh, uh, in the UK. Pretty good. Okay, so we, we start the quarterly project and uh, it goes like this. This is pretty good. And uh, I'm, I had, I had a, you know, I'm not going to tell you what my target was, but I had a target in mind and we were sort of heading for it. It was looking pretty good. And then this happened. This is amazing, right? This is, um, 
this is the power of uh, OpenStreetMap, and you know how it is with some, you know, when people get enthusiastic, and we have some really dedicated people, which is great, uh, and people put their minds to it and think about how to do this efficiently, uh, we can get some great progress. So this comes from dedicated mappers, it comes from having some official data to guide us, and from having, you know, I guess, motivation. Um, so yeah, we have, uh, we, have, we have now got more than 100,000 solar panels mapped in the UK. That's, a, that's one tenth of the uh, estimated total capacity. So that's fantastic. If anyone here was involved in that, then I want to thank you very much. I know uh, Jerry, who's a co-author on this presentation, did a lot of work on this. Um, we have another few days left. Another few days before the end of September, and if anyone wants to join in, then we'd be very, very grateful. And just for a little bit of uh, obsessing on it, here's the data that we've mapped. Uh, on the left you see solar farms, on the right you see solar panels. You'll see there's, there's differences in, in distribution and location. The vast, we've got, uh, let's see, I can't remember the numbers now, but we've got lots of uh, solar farms oh, there at the top. We've got about 600 or 700 solar farms, and then, as I said, about 100,000 uh, separate small-scale uh, solar installations. Uh, yes, as I've said, I want to thank the people. We have about 130 UK mappers, uh, I think, explicitly uh, taking part in this process. This is just from analysing the user IDs that took part. Um, uh, and also the people who were involved in shaping this whole thing. Uh, there are lots of people involved. I've put some names up on there of people who were especially involved in discussing uh, and planning. Uh, and now some observations. So. Uh, as I've said, the larger solar farms are, are pretty much fine. Uh, from an open street map point of view, I don't think we need to worry too much about it. They're often available in official data, such as planning data. They're very, very easy for machine learning to, to learn to detect. Um, and they're very easy from aerial imagery as well. So uh, really, uh, for us as a community, especially in, uh, where we have grid-connected small-scale uh, solar. The mapping of the small-scale solar is where, is where we, we are, you know, important value added. Um, something that's really, uh, really came out again and again is that the data are highly clustered. Uh, solar farms, as well as solar panels, we find very often that they're clustered. There are many reasons for this. There are geographical reasons why places would be good and bad for this. There are social reasons why you might get a solar panel because your neighbor's getting a solar panel. Lots of different things going on. There is also, of course, clustering in a particular mapper's effort. If I'm going to map my local region, then maybe there is clustering due to the efforts of the mapper. This has consequences for analysis because we can't assume that what we've got is a representative distribution even though we're, uh, we've got a large portion of the data. So this, this clustering um, is something to be aware of in analysis. It's also something to be aware of in mapping because searching randomly uh, can be a little bit fruitless sometimes but, but, you, but you hit these clusters and you find loads of solar panels all in one region and that's fantastic. Um, the imagery quality gives us a massive variation in usefulness. It really does. Uh, and so what we'd love, uh, in order to sort of take this forward, is if, there are, if, if, if Max R or any other nice people are in the audience and want to help us find all the solar panels in the country and in the world, you know, we'd love some good imagery to help with this. Um, oh yeah, this is nice. So when you're mapping small-scale solar, sometimes you can... Uh, uh, see when you walk in the street, you can see some things that aren't going to be visible in the aerial imagery. But conversely, there's plenty that you can't see from ground level, and you're only going to see from aerial. So in practice, we have to have both of these types of mapping. And yes, we, we have this ongoing thing about fast mapping versus craft mapping. In the, uh, in the plot here, the blue block is, is nodes. Everything else is the, uh, is the areas, and so we've got a vast majority of the additions come as single nodes, and then we've got the slightly more detailed stuff 
uh, coming as about a tenth of the data there. I, it's, it's great for us to have both of these things and we're going to analyze both of these things. I think it's still an open question about exactly which is the right strategy. I know this has a lot of parallels with, for example, the humanitarian uh, data mapping where you know, it, it substitute buildings for solar panels. Um, the current work that uh, we're going to do, uh, we've, we've got a new project, and uh, when I say we, I'm talking now about me and Open Climate Fix. Uh, we have some work which is funded by the Alan Turing Institute in London, and uh, we're going to take the data from OpenStreetMap, but also from other sources. We're going to do some data wrangling uh, so that we can get sort of a, 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 a combined rich source of data which we then put together to create these, these predictions that I talked about. Um, and as part of this data wrangling, we're going to do a little bit of work which will hopefully provide more suggestions for things that can go into OpenStreetMap, but you know, this is just sort of general ongoing work. The conclusion is map solar photovoltaics, please. Um, we've, we've done really good work in the UK. I am aware that other countries do, some other countries have uh, good mapping of solar panels. I think Germany and Italy are the main ones that come up in, uh, uh, when I search for uh, the data. Um, we want to take this global. We're going to be able to reduce the use, uh, the amount of uh, CO2 emissions in uh, the national grid uh, power systems. The UK is a relatively small country, but we're, we're doing this, and we want to, do, we want to make the same uh, process available worldwide. So mapping solar and uh, solar installations uh, in your own country is going to be valuable. We are using this data. Um, and broadening out from the project that I have in mind, um, this, uh, you know, we, I, I probably don't need to argue this to, too much to you, but open data is a, is a foundation, a seed for other people to have other ideas and do different things with this data. Maybe people, uh, we, we can use it to create uh, training data, new training data for machine learning, for example. We can certainly use it, there, there may be ideas about planning solar installations that can be done with this. Um, uh, yeah, so if, if anyone wants to come up with something great to do with this new data, then we'd be very uh, pleased. And I'm going to say again, thank you to all the mappers because they're the, uh, they're the lifeblood of this. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much. So thank you, Dan, for the talk. Very good and uh, very inspiring. Are there any questions? Uh, you mentioned sort of aerial photography. Have you looked at um, sent on satellite data? Because of the latency is a lot shorter than the aerial photography for identifying the big ones at least. Yes, so the question was about Sentinel satellite data. I think Jerry actually has done more with this than I have. So would you mind taking the microphone up there? He can answer. Um, so just a general thing, the Sentinel data is obviously not particularly high resolution, so it's not great for the small scale spotting of things, but it does have, for example, other wavelengths than visible and could be useful. Jerry. Uh, yes, yes, I've used Sentinel explicitly for mapping solar farms, but it's not got the resolution for mapping um, the uh, rooftop solar. Uh, I mean, in particular, there are two or three solar installations on top of reservoirs, so they're floating installations, which I was particularly interested to find. Um, and one was very recent, and I was managed to find it on Sentinel. And also one I saw coming back on the train from Open Data Camp in Aberdeen, which I located with Sentinel. Um, the moisture index is very useful for finding them. Thank you, Dan. Question there in the back. If you go uh, right at the back. Oh, no, Here. he's going this way. Okay, yeah, you got it. Uh, so, as I see it, you found about 15% of all the small-scale solar cell in your data. Do you have any indication where to look for to find the rest one, like from the public data that are per county or whatever? Yes, yes. Um, the, 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 the process is, is, is not complete in that sense, in that the, the, the official data that we have do tell us where to look for, for the things that we haven't yet mapped. Uh, so yes, it's, it's simply a, a question of pushing on through, and we'll see if the enthusiasm, how far it takes us. Yeah. 
There was a question right at the back up there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I hope some, uh, to see somebody to run up here to have some exercise in the afternoon. But, yeah. uh, anyway, um, I wanted to warn that uh, nowadays we have these integrated solar panels which are not visible. I mean, if you are sitting on that or touching with your hand, you cannot recognize it. So uh, in the future, it will be harder and harder to uh, see the new uh, small scale installations. But thank you for uh, working on that. This uh, renewable energies are uh, extremely important things to tackle with. Mm, yeah, thanks. Yeah, there's a lot of complications. Um, another complication which we haven't mentioned is that you don't really know from looking at a solar installation whether it's active, whether it's connected to the grid. Um, there, are, there are other complications in here, but yeah, we can... Um, uh, yeah, so uh, solar tiles are going to be very hard to integrate. We just hope people yeah. will add them. Yeah. Can, can I add a couple of riders to that? One of my focuses in this quarterly project is to ensure that we had... Um, the, the official data is by local authority area, local government area. So one of my targets was that we had at least five local government areas where we had over 80% of the available mm. predicted solar panels. We have one place which is about 96% and a few in the 80% range. And then about 20 which have more than half um, identified. So they provide, they're the, they're the sort of baseline for how likely we are to get um, completeness of coverage. Um, and solar tiles and solar slate, I haven't seen any solar slate, but solar tiles are still recognizable on reasonable quality aerial imagery. Um, if you look at one of my recent mapillary traces, I made a special voyage to visit 20 houses which had solar tiles. So, um, if you look for some map, SK53 quint mapillary traces in Nottingham, you might find them. You touched a bit on the, some people are mapping nodes, some people attach, are mapping areas, um, but there's also different mappers. Are you worried about different qualities or um, it strikes me there could be a lot of things that we had issues we had with OpenTube map in the past things like a mapper might stop mapping far away because they think someone else you know they might not go too far because they think oh Dan's mapping from that direction and and it gets hard to know where the gaps are and dealing with it not being people that have been trained in all the same ways We haven't really seen problems with that, and I don't see it as a major problem because we have all, all sorts of different sources of um, missing data. There are lots of different reasons for missing data, and it, certainly in terms of analysis, that's not going to be a particularly big problem because the problem is there in, 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 intrinsically. Uh, in terms of mapping and completing the map, um, mm, yeah, yeah, maybe. One thing I would like to do is, is, is to, in order to scale it up, is to take it um, to a much more crowdsource approach in the sense of people who aren't involved in OpenStreetMap at all. And, now, and there, there's a very tricky question of how to get people who don't do any OpenStreetMapping to walk down the street and say, these three are in OpenStreetMap already, but I've spotted this one. Uh, and I'm not actually sure the best way to, to do that, but we'd really like to do something along those lines, yeah. M for all the questions and thanks then for the presentation. Yep, thank you.